But I can start with my introductions of um, today's speaker. So it's really my pleasure to introduce you um, to Professor uh, Frank De Salvo. Um, mm -hmm. So Frank received all of his degrees in physics. Don't count that against him. Um, receiving his um, undergrad. Well, degree. applied physics is different than physics. I know. That's I'm, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm getting there slowly, Frank. Mm -hmm. Getting his undergrad degree in physics at MIT and his um, PhD degree in applied physics uh, from Stanford University. Um, after graduating in the 70s, let's put it that way, Frank <laughs> received, I think, what was at that time the sort of ticket to um, academic success. He was um, um, employed by AT&T Bell Labs right out of school, which is a, a tremendous honor. And that Bell Labs wasn't just happy to be there, but actually excelled and um, eventually rose to lead multiple groups um, that have had impacts all over the place. In 86, Frank came back to Cornell, and he's been a professor in chemistry ever since. Among his many accolades, and I can go on and on, he's actually a member of the National Academy of Sciences, which I think you know is probably one of the most um, elite awards that we endow on as scientists in the United States. He's emeritus, but the, the favorite part about his bio I like is that he is um, uh, essentially retired but you can find him in Baker Lab pretty much all the time. All right, so it's my pleasure to have Frank tell us about fuel cells and hydrogen. Thank you, Lyndon. So I have kind of a froggy voice today, so if it fades away a little bit, just yell at me and I'll try to come back. I've got some water to try to keep, keep my vocal cords lubricated. Uh, so I can get a, a little bit of a grasp of uh, who you are, now that you know who I am. Uh, I'd like to just ask you a few questions. Uh, how many are at the energy seminar for the first time? Good, okay. Uh, how many of you have heard something about the hydrogen economy? Ever heard of that? Okay. How about fuel cells? You ever heard that? Do you, you know something about what they are? Do you know a few fuel cell if you tripped on one? You might, okay. All right, so we're going to be talking about all of those things that I've ju just said or mentioned, and we're going to come at it from several different directions. Uh, I'm going to be talking about specifically about the hydrogen economy and what it takes to enable a, the economy. I think we have many of the pieces. Some of them need to uh, need significant advance, engineering advance. Some of them need discovery, better catalysts, and things of that sort. But I think it's coming. So we'll, we'll hear about uh, this, and uh, we'll see how well the prediction is. I hope a little long enough to find out if we can get to the hydrogen economy, but I don't know. Okay, so let's just jump right in and say, since this is an energy seminar, you could have guessed that fuel cells have something to do with energy. And the, the guess is a good one, but how are they going to help us with the energy challenge? I'll say, state what the energy challenge is. The energy challenge is that we get most of our energy from fossil fuels which contain carbon, which make carbon dioxide, which leads to climate change, and eventually will make the planet not suitable for human habitation if we don't do something about it. This is aimed at doing something about it. So I'm going to tell you about some pieces. First, about hydrogen. Hydrogen is the ideal fuel because it contains no carbon. If we could find other fuels that could uh, be combusted to, to uh, make energy or make heat, let's say, it didn't contain carbon, our problem would be solved. What's nice about the fossil fuels is that they exist in the ground, you just dig them up. So fossil fuels are energy storage already. They stored the energy of the sun when, when plants or algae were growing hundreds of millions of years ago and then got under pressure in the ground and turned into coal and oil and gas and things of that sort. And so we have lots of stored energy already in the planet. Again, the problem is that this contains carbon. So we're going to try to invent uh, an energy economy that does not contain carbon to start with sources like solar and wind, uh, hydro, all the ones that even nuclear, but no carbon. Let's see if we can do it. So here's the rationale for, for a fuel cell challenge. Uh, it, it looks like we're never going to have an economy where we are completely free of, uh, of some kind of fuel that fuels are very energy dense. 
the, the fossil fuels we dig up out of the ground means per unit weight or unit volume, there is a lot of energy packed into it. And by, by the energy, I'm just talking about the combustion energy, the heat that you can get out about combusting those things. Um, so if you, there are going to be some cases where you're going to need a lot of energy stored somewhere in a, in a tank. Uh, and, and we're going to need it probably for very heavy machinery. We're not likely to run those on lithium batteries, for example. Uh, so we're going to need some. So that's number one. We assume that this is the case. Then, number two, if you've gone through the trouble of making fuels, uh, you want to use them as efficiently as possible. It'd be silly to throw it away. We'd just be throwing money away. Mm -hmm. So you've got to use it as efficiently as possible. And we'll be talking about that. That's part of the hydrogen economy, as I'll show you. If the fuel is, in fact, used just for heating, we're going to take the combustion. Uh, we don't really have a problem except a CO2 problem because those things are very efficient. So if you have a natural gas furnace in your home and it's relatively new, it probably runs about 95% efficiency. That is, 95% of the heat ends up in the house instead of outdoors. That's pretty good. You haven't got much room for improvement there. On the other hand, if you're going to have stored chemical energy and fuels like fossil fuels and transform it to something a bit more useful like electricity or motion, then that's a heat engine. We're using the heat. Uh, even in nuclear cases, we're using the heat to, dr to make steam and then to drive turbines, which run generators, which make electricity. But at the core, it's a heat engine. And we all know from thermodynamics that heat engines are limited in their efficiency by the, this simple expression that Carnot came with it, hot and cold temperature difference in the, in the heat engine. And that's a pretty small number unless you get to very high uh, temperatures. If this is small enough, you can ignore it. But then it's got to be really small. And we got best we have that is something like room temperature. I'll give you an example. If we have automotive engines in, in most cars today, they, they are actually running at about 30% efficiency. That's less than the, the, the Carnot limit. So Carnot says you can't get any better than that. It's all, there's always some losses or something that's not ideal, and you end up about 30% efficient. For That means that 70% of the heat goes outside the car goes out through the radiator, the tailpipe, whatever, and the rest is turned into motion. Okay, well, that's, that's a significant loss. It's also the case for electrical generation. In the U.S., we still use primarily fossil fuels to generate electricity, and that, that, those plants run, on average, at about 35% efficient. You can make it a bit more efficient if you take the, let's say, the fossil fuel uh, at 70% efficient, or 30% efficient, 35% efficient uh, in generating the electricity, the heat that's left over, the exhaust heat, if you like, that's left over could be used for heating a campus. And in fact, that's exactly what we do here at Cornell. We take in natural gas, we generate electricity, and with the heat, the heat coming out of the back end of the turbine, we, we heat the water up on the campus and then circulate it around campus heating the buildings. So that's how we're heating it. That runs at about overall, if you count both things, 60 to 70 percent efficient. That's much better. But nowhere near where we like to get to, which is near 100 percent. And we c can, with fuel cells, in principle, aha, so this is run off here. You have to look over here. Fuel cells, in principle, can reach about up to or around 100 percent, at least ideally, in principle, they can. And we're going to talk about why that is. So fuel cells are not, wow, uh, Lyndon, if you sit there and just hold it down. Nope, no. <laughs> nope. We're going to engineer this. Oh, here. perfect. Somebody's already worried about that. There we go. Okay. So that's why fuel cells. Okay. Uh, now, we'll see that with fuel cells, hydrogen is the ideal fuel. And so that'll connect to that. We're going to connect the pieces together. Uh, so let's start to see where, we, where, we, where we'll go first. Let's talk about hydrogen as a fuel. Hydrogen is not something you can dig out of the ground. You have to synthesize hydrogen, that is take hydrogen from wherever it is found, often in fossil fuels, like in natural gas, CH4. Uh, so you could take hydrogen out of the 
natural gas, but then you have carbon, and in the process that carbon's turned to carbon dioxide, and so you're making carbon dioxide. We don't want to do that. Uh, so we have to make hydrogen uh, by, by some way that is not going to increase the amount of greenhouse gases in the, in the air. But hydrogen is already uh, handled on an industrial scale, especially in the petrochemical industry. So hydrogen is used uh, for doing something called uh, cracking uh, down here. So take oils and whatever and turn it into other uh, things like gasoline by adding some hydrogen and a, and a proper catalyst. But hydrogen is used for all sorts of things in power plants. For example, hydrogen is used as a cooling gas in, uh, in generators. About 16,000 are installed already. There's more. Why is hydrogen good as a cooling gas? It's good as a cooling gas because it's a very light molecule. The energy it has is on the order of kT per molecule. Uh, and therefore, that, and that's the kinetic energy. If you have a very light mass, kT has to be stored in the velocity. That is, those molecules are moving very fast. Okay, so they can transport energy very fast. They are also have very low viscosity. So you can get the heat out of the, out of the generator, get it to a sink, and make that gas flow through uh, quite easily because it's low viscosity. And so that's what was done here. But you can see there's lots of things done with hydrogen, lots and lots. Not quite at a scale that we would need if we had a full hydrogen economy, but it says the technologies exist to get there. Okay, so it turns out that about 95% of, of hydrogen production, oh, let's go back here, uh, is not done uh, in simple ways. It's done by taking fossil fuels and getting the hydrogen out that I've already mentioned. So let's see how they do that, just so you have an idea. Whoops, I'm going the wrong way. Let's go this way. So you extract the hydrogen from hydrocarbons or water. So from coal, if you just heat it with steam to high enough temperatures on the order of 1,000 degrees centigrade, sometimes with a catalyst, you'll make hydrogen and CO, carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is toxic, so you have to do something with the, with the gas to remove the carbon monoxide, but you can collect the hydrogen. So now that's where hydrogen comes from, not from coal anymore, because you get much more uh, hydrogen if you start with methane, natural gas, because the carbon already has four hydrogens associated with it. You combine that with water and you make a lot more hydrogen at a somewhat lower temperatures. This is called steam reforming of, of a fossil fuel into a lot of hydrogen and some carbon monoxide. Now you also want to get rid of the carbon monoxide, so there's another reaction down here, the water gas shift reaction, where you take CO and water and turn it into CO2 plus more hydrogen. And you can do that at a low temperature with some special catalyst. So you have now the steps you would need to get all the way to pure hydrogen, but it leaves you with a lot of carbon dioxide in the air. That's not good. How, how are we going to avoid that? Actually, maybe we'll ask another question first. We're going to avoid, uh, uh, avoid it by making the hydrogen from water, directly from water, by electrolysis. How many of you remember in high school doing an experiment where you stick two electrodes in an acid, run a current through it, and watch the bubbles coming up from the electrodes? Anybody remember doing that experiment? Those bubbles coming up on one side are hydrogen, and on the other side are oxygen, the components of water, just splitting water apart. And so you can think of this as a, uh, just a simple device. It's a, it's a device called an electrolyzer. It has two electrodes, so it's somewhat like a battery. And you take water and you convert it into hydrogen gas and oxygen by passing a current through the cell at a relatively low voltage, somewhere between 1 and 2 volts. Actually, it's a little bit higher than 1.3 volts. Uh, and that reaction works quite well. It turns out that uh, the use of this kind of uh, electrolyzer is increasing tremendously, in part because of a company called Proton Onsite. They sell these electrolyzers, and they sell them mainly to the in industries that want to use hydrogen, but they only want to have to store the hydrogen or not store hydrogen, only want to generate hydrogen or get hydrogen when they need it. So they don't have big tanks farms out back with hydrogen. So you can generate the hydrogen on site 
with a, uh, an electrolyzer and you produce things that don't have any carbon in it. There's no carbon to start with. The electrolysis does not lead to making further carbon dioxide. And so one imagines that one would scale these up, and I've seen some pretty large units for ele electrolysis, to make hydrogen from water. And we have plenty of water. We'll be able to get to plenty of hydrogen. And then we're going to take the hydrogen and either combust it, combine it with oxygen, and the products will be water. So you go from water to hydrogen and oxygen back to water again. Okay? Ultimately, the, the energy is coming from having made all that water in the past, in the past of the planet. Let's see if I want to say anything else about this. Yes, I probably do. All right, let me, let me just point that the two electrodes here. This is slightly out of focus. It says cathode here. Cathode is a, a complex, a complex uh, blend of materials, including some catalysts, some, in this case, some platinum catalyst inside and on this side, a different catalyst. Uh, and it's, it's these two electrodes that are necessary, passing current through it from the outside. So this current, where is it going to come from? This current's going to come from excess solar, excess wind. So it's going to, every time this, the system is not 100% utilized, it has excess capacity. And that excess capacity can be used to make hydrogen without changing anything that will already be in the part of the infrastructure. So that's a good thing. And it means uh, that we can then, once the hydrogen is made and stored somewhere in a tank probably, in pressure tanks, you can take it out and run it through a cell that looks something like this, that's run in reverse from this, and that's called a fuel cell. So running it, uh, running it the way it's shown here is an electrolyzer, running it in reverse is a fuel cell. All right. So neato, you can get a fuel cell. We'll see what the fuel cells do in a minute. Um, let me, I want to go back to, let's do this. So let me say a little bit more about what a fuel cell is. A fuel cell is an energy conversion device. It goes from chemical energy stored in the hydrogen uh, to electrical energy. It's not a heat engine. Therefore, it's not limited by Carnot's efficiency, not limited at all by, by second law uh, concepts. So that's terrific. It uh, means that you, in principle, if you have everything right, you should be able to do this transformation at 100% of the uh, Gibbs energy, Gibbs free energy, or the so-called free energy of the reaction. OK, so a fuel cell is a two-terminal device, like the electrolyzer we were looking at, or like a battery. Any simple battery has a positive and negative side of the battery. And that's all it is then. So it's just two, two electrodes. Um, in, a, in a battery, we have all the chemicals necessary to generate electricity in the battery shell. And when all those chemicals have reacted, the battery is dead. If it's a primary battery, you throw it away. If it's a secondary battery, you can recharge it a certain number of times and it's still usable. Um, in the case of a fuel cell, the fuel cell sits there uh, uh, just as, a, as an, ele an electrolysis unit, sits there and the fuel sits outside, sits in tanks outside or, or whatever, it's just outside. And you can feed, when you can feed fuel, food, <laughs> fuel and oxidizer uh, to the device just when you need the electricity, okay? Otherwise, from the, the wind and solar, when you have excess both of those things, you, you just stop generating and, and things sit idle and you don't do anything with it. Might as well make, make uh, hydrogen. Okay. Okay, so the reactant fuel is oxidized and the, uh, ox the oxidizer uh, is reduced. So we reduce oxygen and oxidize hydrogen in a fuel cell. And we, we pass the electrodes in those reactions. These are called redox reactions because they involve the transfer of an electron. Anything that involves the transfer of an electron or one or more can be split apart into a fuel cell so that you have one process occurring at one electrode and the other process occurring at the second electrode. Okay, so these are redox reactions. 
Uh, here's our example where we're going to make hydrogen and then use oxygen from the air so we don't have to carry that around. And in the fuel cell, it's going to produce water. It'll either be liquid or gas, depending on the temperature that you do. Gas would be steam, temperature that you're running it at. So you take two moles of oxygen gas, let's see, two moles of hydrogen gas, one mole of oxygen gas, and produce two moles of liquid water or water vapor. So the maximum work at constant pressure, for those of you who remember some of your thermodynamics, is the, is the free energy of formation, or delta G of formation. This little zero means in the standard state. That is room temperature, 25 degrees centigrade, and one atmosphere pressure, something of that sort. And from that, you can measure a cell voltage between those two contacts. And that's called a standard cell voltage if this is all at standard conditions. And this reaction says the Gibbs free energy can be, eternal, be turned totally into electrical energy. This little expression here is N, the number of electrons that are involved in the reaction. In the hydrogen case, it's four electrons, when, you, when we go back and look at it. Uh, it's four electrons in, in the reaction as written. That's just a constant that tells you how many coulombs there are in a mole of electrons times this standard voltage. Very simple expression. Chemists have determined most of these. Sometimes they've determined it by building a cell and seeing this potential and just going backwards. So you can do it either way. Works very well. What else? Okay. Now, there's just a note about uh, nomenclature and chemical equations. In, in uh, chemistry and chemical engineering and physics as well, there are lots and lots of parameters and uh, states and so on that use a symbol to, to tell you what they're talking about like V, capital V. Well, I could, if you're a thermodynamicist, that might stand for volume. If you're a, an electrical engineer, that might stand for the voltage between two terminals. Uh, if you uh, look at E, this little E here, E could mean electric field, could mean the potential. So you have to be careful. Electric chemists use this, this script E for voltage between two terminals rather than V because that could be mistaken for volume or a, a voltage that the, the, uh, a physicist might talk about. So you have to be careful. When you see these variables, you have to know the context in which they're used so you know which one it is. In textbooks that cover all of this stuff, like in Jeff Tester's uh, textbook, you can go back to an appendix and it has an appendix of all of these symbols and which, what it means. <coughs> okay. So here we are. Here's a, here's a better view of a fuel cell now. Again, I'll, I'll move over here. So we're going to start with a, two electrodes, something between the two electrodes that would be like water, but we don't want the water to spill, so we have a hydrated uh, polymeric conductor that allows the, the hydrogen to come into the catalyst and split apart to f four H pluses and four electrons. The H pluses become surrounded by water and are carried around, and often the chemical formula for that is often written as, as H3O plus. Uh, with platinum, this reaction occurs very easily at room temperature. That is, hydrogen can be split apart on a platinum surface at room temperature at a very high rate. Okay, that's perfect catalyst because we need to split it apart. At the other side of the fuel cell, you take in oxygen. The oxygen combines with the the protons that are made down here, or this way, swimming across with the water, combines with that to make, make water molecules. So this is just the same as combusting hydrogen with oxygen. You get exactly the same products. So this is making combustion, taming combustion, so that there's no heat from combustion. All that heat energy goes into the free energy. The electrons that are released go from the gathered up on this electrode, go through the external load to the electrode over here, and are delivered to the oxygen to reduce it to make, to make water. Very simple. A very simple device. It's exactly the inverse of the electrolysis uh, cell that we were looking at. Some people are trying to develop cells so that you don't need a, one specifically designed for electrolysis and one specifically designed for making energy. That depends on the catalyst you have. The catalysts make these reactions go as fast as you can. The best catalyst that we have for splitting oxygen apart and making water is pretty lousy. It's a very slow reaction. And if you want to get sizable currents out of, the, out of the machine, you have to push that reaction, make it go faster. 
And that represents an energy loss, and it's represented by something called the overpotential. Electrochemistry is all about overpotentials, if you're worried about rates. And overpotentials then determine what goes on, and overpotentials are usually determined by what the catalyst is that you're actually using. Okay, so that's a fuel cell. Here's all the reactions that go on in the fuel cell at the, at the different pieces. I'm not going to go through all of this, but this fuel cell makes a voltage under standard conditions of about 1.23 volts. That's pretty easy to remember because almost every battery that you can buy, a single cell, is at about 1.2 volts. If you buy a standard primary cell, non-rechargeable cell, it's 1.2 volts. Everybody, almost everybody remembers that. How many people knew that's what the battery voltage is? 1.2 volts. Ooh, interesting. Is that a high voltage or a small voltage? Compared to what, right? So if you put your fingers across one volt, nothing will happen. If you put your fingers across the electrodes coming out of the wall, the plug coming out of the wall, that's 120 volts. That you will feel. If it's 200 volts or higher and you hit the wrong parts of your body, you're dead. So one volt, easily handleable for a single cell. OK. Uh, the electrodes are, in fact, composites, and they're complex, and you have to have nanoparticles to get high surface area and all kinds of engineering that go into making these cells. People are improving on the engineering side all the time. Right now, the big challenge left is those, is those catalysts. Make those catalysts. The catalyst we really need is a catalyst to speed up the oxygen, pulling apart the oxygen reaction. If you can solve that problem, which people have been trying to do for 100 years, if you could solve that problem, I say you would make Bill Gates look poor from the amount of money you would make off that. It would be ridiculous. OK. Here's what the catalyst support looks like, this diaphanous stuff. And then all the little tiny dots are platinum uh, catalysts that are spread out all over this. There's pores through this. It's on a carbon that's nice and flexible. It's a pretty good material, but it has some flaws that we'd like to uh, improve upon. So let's look at a real fuel cell. This is a characteristics of a fuel cell made by General Motors. Most of the large automotive com companies on the planet have fuel cell research and development efforts going. At GM, they have about 200 people working on fuel cells. At Ford, I think it's about 150. GM is really doing a great job. This is a characteristics from a fuel cell that's 100 kilowatt is the power the it can generate 100 kilowatt. Um, and that, that uh, fuel cell is about as big as an engine that would uh, make 100 kilowatts of, of power from an uh, uh, internal combustion engine. So it's about this big. It takes one liter of hydrogen per second. One liter of hydrogen per second at standard pressure per second operating at, at, the, at the conditions we're seeing here, where the voltage is about one volt, below one volt, and we'll address that in a minute, and the current is about an amp per square centimeter of electrode surface. Okay. Uh, so let's look at this. It says that the equilibrium potential is 1.169. It's not 1.23, as we put over here, and the reason is this is not under standard conditions. It's running at 80C, not at 25C. It's running at pressures above the pressure that we had before. And it has a certain amount of catalyst in there. If you, so it the, turns out that the equilibrium potential for that cell is a little below 1.23. But it's so little below it, you wouldn't notice in most, perp, in most applications. So when you turn it on, and you don't have anything connected, and you just measure the voltage between the two terminals, it's, uh, it does exactly equal this voltage right here at the top. Okay, So it says it should be that voltage, and that's what you measure. As you start drawing current from this, here's the linear scale for current. As you start drawing current, the potential drops like a stone from the equilibrium potential down to about two-thirds of that value. Notice that zero's off the bottom here. Zero's down here somewhere. So uh, the curve at the bottom is the actual performance of the cell. And it's broken in, this, this performance 
says, well, there's other things that are reducing the, the voltage from what it could be. So here's the, the cell. This cell has ohmic resistance. You're passing current through something. It's going to have resistance to, to the flow. And that, that's a loss, and it shows up here as an ohmic loss. There's a mass transport loss of getting the gases in and out of the, of the fuel cell. But the real big one here is this, is this one. This is called the oxygen reduction reaction. I said it's very slow. If you want it to produce an amp per square centimeter, you've got to pay a big price. You've got to pay all this voltage as a price, and all that ends up as heat with the current going through it. So without a, a better catalyst, <coughs> fuel cells are not going to reach uh, efficiencies much above 50%. So if we're operating in this region, you're at about 0.65 volts times two uh, would get you to uh, equilibrium potential. That's a 50%, 50 percent, 50 percent of the equilibrium potential. So it's only 50 percent efficient. Notice on the other hand, there is no over potential for the hydrogen electrode. This is for the oxygen electrode. For the hydrogen electrode, it's so small it doesn't even show up on this scale. So if we could find a catalyst for oxygen, this is as good as the catalyst we have for hydrogen. To declare victory and go home. Perfect. It will save the planet. Uh, so that's, that's what a lot of people here at Cornell are trying to do, among other things, in fuel cells. OK, so let's see what, are we, what are we got here now. All right, these are just some numbers. So OK. Can you, explain, can you say a quick word about whether the catalyst needs to be solid state? I mean, has anyone? Are people working on catalysts that um, utilize interactions between oxygen and liquids? Not that I know of. Okay. Okay. So that, that's, that's where some of the innovation is going to come, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. to those things. Yeah. OK, so overpotential. It's a really important word. I thought I'd spend a little bit more time talking about overpotential, and then I'll come back to fuel cells. So all reactions have some overpotential. Sometimes it's quite large, as it was for oxygen. And that's not the largest overpotential known. Uh, so let's think about what ha actually happens at an electrode. So let's look at let's look at this reaction. It's actually a, in principle, a reversible reaction. That is, we can either run it this way, or we can run it this way. We're running it this way. We're oxidizing the hydrogen. If we run it backwards, we're reducing the hydrogen. So the way you reach equilibrium is that the forward and backward rates are exactly the same. They're exactly the same. Nothing changes. The concentration of hydrogen, oxygen, whatever, doesn't change. Okay? The molecules doing that are changing. They're exchanging with each other. So they're just in there moving around as fast as they can, going back and forth, back and forth. If you want to get some current out, you now have to apply or have a potential to push that, push that current out. And so here's under the, the, under the standard conditions what happens. So this is, this is the, we'll call this the potential, the equilibrium potential. Uh, if, if you change the voltage by having an external source to make it different from this, there will be some net current either this way or this way, depending on which, how you put the polarity on for the, for the recharger. So you all know when you're recharging a battery that you can't put it in reverse. It won't work. Right? It could actually make the battery blow up. So what happens is that th this is, there is a uh, theory that's worked out and, and well understood at this point that says that the current that's generated is equal to a, this constant plus these exponentials in overpotential. So this and this. Either one or the other dominates depending on the sign and size of the overpotential. Okay? So this is magnified by this factor which is exponential. That, that's why the curve that we looked at at the battery has this funny shape because it's exponential. Okay. All right. So someday if you ever need this you've got it here but don't worry about the details. But this is interesting to know. This has everything to do with the electrodes and the catalyst. So I0 which is usually called the exchange current density, uh, w is, a, is a strong function of what the electrolyte is and what the electrode composition is. It, the electrode must be a conductor. That's the only important thing. If electrons can't move through it, nothing can happen. So it has to be some kind of conductor. 
So let's just look at a, at a cell that's made in one molar HCl at room temperature with different electrodes. With platinum, you get an exchange current of about one milliampere per square centimeter. With copper, it's much smaller, and lead, it's teeny tiny, 10 orders of magnitude lower than for platinum. So platinum is a super catalyst. It's really, it's really a great one. Anything that has a, a large I0 is also sometimes called reversible. And if it's a low number, it's usually called irreversible. OK. So there we uh, talked about this already, I think. Uh, turns out that this is not temperature independent. So it changes a little bit with temperature. It usually goes up a little bit as you heat things up, not surprisingly. OK, when one, one current from the exponentials is bigger than this, you can just use one term of the butler voltmer equation to calculate things. And you can do that. We won't go into the details of that. Now, I've showed you the hydrogen cell that operates at room temperature with a polymer electrolyte membrane. membrane. It's called a PEM, polymer electrolyte membrane. There are many other technologies for making fuel cells that have to do with a different electrolyte or a different fuel. So mo in this case, almost all hydrogen, almost all fuel cell activity is on hydrogen fuel cells. And so I can look up here. Here's our, at the top row is our polymer, electro polymer uh, electrolyte fuel cell. The fuel is hydrogen. This, has, this is the chemical formula for this stuff. It's a polymer called nafion. And what's moving through it is H plus hydrated. And that operates well in the range between 0 and 80 C. Very nice. That's about where we would like it to be. Turns out that you have to be a little careful because if you take in fuels that are contaminating, that is, they carry something else in like sulfur, uh, that will poison the platinum catalyst. What's it means? It reacts with the surface so that the hydrogen can't get at it and it can't take it off and it's, it, you kill it. Okay, so here's an alkaline one. This is what NASA uses on the on the, all the missions to space. They have plenty of hydrogen in the rocket, so they use it to make electricity as well. And that's an alkaline uh, fuel cell. And it's OH that's moving around, not H. And that still operates somewhere near room temperature. Um, it can't, can't tolerate, uh, on the other hand, carbon impurities. It'll kill it. And others that operate at higher temperatures, 200, 650, 500, all of these run with hydrogen, except at the bottom. You get some, some with methane and then others that are even trying to do methanol uh, as well. So that, all that work, as far as I'm aware, the methanol work is, has all been discontinued. And it, it has the problem, of course, that you have carbon in the fuel, you're going to make CO2. So it partly defeats the problem. Right now, the only fuel we can use if you want to avoid carbon is hydrogen. So I think we're just about where we want to be. Here's a methanol fuel cell that they've been using. It doesn't look any different. What's different is the catalyst and what happens to the fuel. The fuel comes apart into carbon dioxide plus hydrogen plus this. There's no hydrogen. If there's no carbon here, there's no carbon there. So it's basically the same cell. Uh, the catalysts are a little bit different. If you, have, if you just use a straight platinum catalyst, this doesn't work at all. So the technology's there. All the things we need to know about the fuel cell are in simple electric simple tables of free energies and enthalpies of reaction. Again, all of this stuff uh, is useful. If you're worried about the change in, in voltage as a function of temperature or pressure away from standard conditions, you can calculate that from the equations that are here. But I don't, I don't think that's worth spending a lot of time on, nor is it spending a lot of time on this. No homework questions. So, so what I've done is to tell you, outline a, an energy system that relies on having wind and solar, excess energy, taking that to electrolyze water to make pure hydrogen, which I can store. And then when I want that extra energy, I put the hydrogen through the fuel cell, and it gets the electricity out of the fuel cell back into the system, and it gets back to water. And then you just do the electrolysis around again. So once you've done that, uh, you've saved the planet. That would be terrific if we can do it. So I, I, I think it's a lot of the pieces are, uh, are being done already. They need to be optimized. We need to find better catalysts. Uh, we will need lots of engineers to work on this, not just a few hundred. 
or, or, uh, as they are at GM, but there'll be a lot more. So I think it's a great place to think about a future uh, where you, you're going to be a very multidisciplinary uh, kind of job and you'll make a fair amount of money and save the planet in the process. So I think that's fantastic. So I'm going to stop here. Right, thank thank you. you very much. Uh, I'll try to answer questions if you have any. Mm -hmm. the, uh, one of the constants, um, uh, cost metrics for progress is $100 a kilowatt hour. So where are we on the well, fuel cells? And yeah, the so they're expensive. So uh, the first fuel cells that GM put together, they told me, cost over a million dollars. <laughs> Why did they do that? Because they had no engineering. They didn't have any design. They didn't know. You had to do all the design and the this and the that. They are still, 10 years later, improving the design and improving the, and looking at catalysts that are better than what they have. In fact, the best catalyst they now have is slightly different than platinum, and it was discovered here at Cornell. So it's a, it's a compound called platinum-3 cobalt, and in the fuel cell, it uh, loses some cobalt at the surface, so it's just platinum at the surface of the nanoparticle, but the interior is platinum-3 cobalt, that's got an ordered structure, and that does something very unusual to the catalyst. It actually makes the catalyst, uh, um, this is for, the, for oxygen reduction I'm talking mm -hmm. about. It makes the, the overpotential uh, gets cut by about 70 millivolts out of 400. So that's a help. It's still not where we want to get to. Mm -hmm. uh, but the a lot of that kind of engineering and, and materials discovery is what's needed so to go the rest of the way. So can you say something about the alkaline fuel cells? So what sort of yep. ballpark cost per kilowatt hour? Well, again, the, the alkaline ones, the only, the only group uh, organization that's used those things are NASA. Mm -hmm. They're built by NASA, mm -hmm. and they're built uh, to be extremely reliable, not low cost. Oh, okay. So... So using them as a benchmark is not very sensible. Whereas anything that's made by the automotive indu industry, their motivation, they're driven by cost, 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 cost. That's, mm -hmm. that's what they're driven by. Um, now, that, that may change some if, the, if, as we're starting to see more and more of changes that, that look like climate is affecting what's happening, if the, if the political uh, environment sh switches fast enough, uh, then cost may not become the number one issue. It may be saving ourselves so that we can eat mm -hmm. or something. And that then, okay, we'll spend plenty and get there. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, what's, I don't know what, how it's going to actually work yeah. out. Yes, anybody else? Yes. Right. Yeah, excellent question. I got, I got the idea. So the question was, uh, we've got hydrogen. What about these other types? Are they going to be players in the game? Uh, so they, they, they will be players, but not for every technology. So for example, some of the fuel cells I showed at the bottom of that list operate at very high temperatures. It's not likely that you're going to have a battery or a fuel cell this big running at 800 degrees C, sitting about six inches away from your feet. That's a bit, that's red hot, right? And you have to keep it red hot if you want it to be able to start like that. So it doesn't seem to be a viable technology for transportation, but for just storage and conversion of energy, okay, that's fine. For, for stationary uh, storage at, let's say, at, at a generating plant, you could have, a, you could have it run at high temperatures because you've got to have a separate building, probably underground, where you do that. So uh, you want the fuel cell to work as well as it can at room temperature. Of course, it gets cold in Ithaca. When it gets below freezing, you might have a, an interesting problem making water. Um, so you have to think about how you engineer. They've now engineered things, so that's not a problem. It's, a, it's very interesting to see how it's done because fuel cell does produce a little bit of heat and they make sure that heat goes just where it needs to go for the water to get out before it freezes. Um, and so uh, 
probably you're not going to use it much above 80 C just because you can't live in an environment that's 80 C. So that, that fuel cell, those fuel cells can handle the 80 C as you saw on this. So I, so I think it'll be relevant to the, to the right technology. The place where we really need it is automotive, in, in my opinion, um, because that's going to be the hardest to wean from the fossil fuels. We've got, we've got solar, we've got wind. It's gonna, it'll get better, but it won't be perfect. Yes? Um, I was curious, you mentioned automotive. Can you actually maybe ask if you're asking from Ford's um, battery electric vehicle development right. um, vision. I'm kind of curious, what do you think will be the driving force in keeping companies like Ford and GM putting a lot of resources towards investing in new fuel cells as opposed to being swayed in the direction of focusing like solely on battery electric vehicles? Well, I think, the, uh, I think electric vehicles are coming. They'll be part of the mix. When I say it's going to be a fuel cell car, it's likely to have a fuel cell. It's likely to have some batteries. It's likely to have something called supercapacitors. You know what a supercapacitor is? Yeah, okay. So if you want to step on the gas and have it go boom, the fuel cell won't produce the energy that fast, but you can take it from a supercapacitor and just dump it, boom, and it'll run. And then you use battery for kind of intermediate things and the fuel cell's kind of in the background. So think of the fuel cell as you think base load power, like a nuclear power. You could just do base load all the time. And then the, the battery and the, and the supercapacitor is going to help you do other things. So it's going to be a compo complex piece of electrical machinery. That's what I think. Uh -huh. But your scheme for using wind, excess wind power and solar power also has the generation of the hydrogen. What is the inefficiency uh -huh. of the generation of the hydrogen? Now, aren't you clever? That's precisely the thing. I told you every electric chemical reaction, whether we're running it forward or backward, is going to have an overpotential. It doesn't have to be symmetric, but it's going to be overpotential both for using the fuel cell and for generating the, the hydrogen from water. And we're exactly in the same boat with uh, electrolysis, we need better catalysts. We still need better catalysts. But it's, it's basically the same kind of catalyst because we're going to be working with oxygen in both cases. And we just let the oxygen go in the atmosphere. Maybe there's a use for it, for, for bottled gas or something, but we'll be producing much more oxygen than we'll use for anything else. Um, so yes, right now the overall efficiency of the, of the system is a bit would be a bit lower than the efficiency that you're likely to get out of hybrid technology. Uh, so without those improvements, probably the, the, the full fuel cell thing is not going to happen. So it all, all the timing just depends on when and if those better catalysts are discovered. So the materials people here are working really hard on the problem and ma making some progress, as I've said. Yes? Uh -huh. Are you able to replace or recharge the catalyst, or would it just be a swap out replacement like it is? Yeah, that's a good, good question. Uh, the question really, uh, the larger question is really around durability. How long does this last, and what are, what are the ways that it can fail? So it turns out that the, you have to worry about the chemistry of everything, uh, especially when you have electrochemistry in play. Uh, and you can, you c inadvertently, you can dissolve some of the components. And so there's a lot of things that you have to worry about in this. But um, right now, if, if we used precious metals in the, in the fuel cell, if the fuel cell dies, my guess is we'd replace the guts uh, and, and have it go on, just like we do now with the catalytic converters in your car. So when your car dies, they take that converter out and they take all the precious metal out of that and use it again. So I think something, something like that will be what happens. Another, another place where, th where real advances have been made and more will be made is in storing hydrogen in tanks. So for the cars that GM has, the fuel tank, the gas tank, is at very high pressure and it takes up about as much space as the back seat uh, so it's a, or, or the trunk. So it's a pretty big container for the, for the gas. And if you're going to st store it on industrial scale, those containers are going to have to be fairly large or have a large number of them. So the largest one I've seen might be about 
uh, a third of the volume of this room. Uh, and if you had lots of those. Now, in interestingly enough, GM has even engineered this so that you can take a, a high-powered rifle and shoot a bullet through the, through the hydrogen gas storage tank and it does not blow up or do anything, whatever. So it's really amazing. Uh, so that's another worry that people, when you say hydrogen, people say, hydrogen, that's explosive. If we had done it the other way around, they'd be saying, gasoline, that's explosive. <laughs> well, in fact, we, we're so used to gasoline, we don't think of it as hazard in driving the car, but it is. Yes? It seems to me in a systems context, uh, you're starting with the really desirable electric. We're using only renewable mm -hmm. sources of electricity. And so the fundamental technical question becomes one, what's the most efficient and most watched way of storing it? Mm -hmm. Do we store it as hydrogen, convert it to hydrogen, store it as hydrogen yep. versus do we store it in terms of battery? Um, and in some, for some uses, you can store it thermally. Well, yep. You don't have to, but I am yep. for the, the electricity That's right. use. And so that really has to do with the economics of an awful lot of other things, namely yep. what's the optimal scale of conversion yep. on both ends, yep. you know, yep. and also of transport. Yep. So you're absolutely right. In the end, uh, economics makes, a, makes all the difference at the <coughs> moment. Maybe, maybe it will always be that way. I don't know. But the... Uh, that makes this really exciting because we, you, get, you have to work with all kinds of people like economists as you are, right? So it's a... Hey, I was an electrical engineer. Ah, you were an electrical engineer first, okay. <laughs> no, but I think the question I heard there that is that, uh, perhaps even more interesting than economics is that there's a systems component. Yes, and absolutely. And I think oftentimes, you know, in optimizing the catalyst mm -hmm. and the component, no allowance is made for the fact that this has to live in a system mm -hmm. that the demands might be completely different. Yep. You know? uh, yeah, so, so what so you find in the lab... discover the system only That's after right. they have a viable right. prototype. Right. And then it's sometimes too late because the system yep. doesn't work. Yep. So that's, th that's some challenge also for the researchers, as you know well, is that what you can do in a beaker, you, can't, you may not be able to do on the industrial scale or vice versa. Uh, so it's uh, each each one of these things has to be explored, and you get to work and see what happens. But it's it's a lot of fun, and it's uh, I think it's likely to be the wave of the future. So write it down, and check in 50 years, see see if I was right. I'll be very pleased if I was right. Anyway, thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank all of you. So today um, there's no lunch.